gentlemen, we are about ready. Ladies and gentlemen, we are about ready to begin the panel discussion, so I'd like to ask all of the panelists to please uh, join us on the stage. Uh, I'll mention some of the names, actually. Uh, unfortunately, Adonis actually had to just leave, so he won't be joining us yep. for the panel. Uh, Louis Damore, uh, if you could please uh, join us. Here, I'll sit on the end, maybe, and then I'll, I'll let you sit closer to the middle. Uh, Professor Pinelli, are you here yet? Professor Hi. Pinelli, have you arrived? Uh, there, I think there may have been a flight delay with Professor Pinelli, but if, if he's here, please uh, come upstairs. Uh, Axel Caicedo from the Natural Planet Foundation. Mr. Caicedo, are you here as well? Thank you very much. No, we might need to take away a few chairs. Uh, Nicola Fury is here, so welcome also to you. Uh, I'm here as well. And then Giovanni, as well as Pilar, if you could join us. Giovanni, are ah, good. All right, so then I will come to here, and then we can take away maybe the last two chairs. Keep them close by, just in case Professor Pinelli should join us. And uh, Shannon uh, Stowell. Shannon, are you here? Would you like to join us? Ah, good. Okay, excellent. Everyone is here. So, okay, uh, I will now give the moderation to uh, one of the most important advisory board members. And, uh, ah, we need the camera, actually, so before I do that, I'll wait until Darnell gives us the signal. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to welcome you back for the concluding panel discussion of the day, and I'm very privileged the moderation will be taken over by Lord Jack McConnell, former First Minister of Scotland, the longest serving First Minister ever, actually seven years, and uh, in addition to that, currently a member of the House of Lords. So ladies and gentlemen, if you could please give a big round of applause for Lord Jack McConnell, who will moderate the panel. Thank you. Mark, have that list. The list, the list. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Is the microphone? microphone? Oh, here we go. Mic, Darnell. Okay. Excellent. Welcome. I'm sure everyone is, uh, has had a very long day, so we will try and make this session as interesting as possible, although I think uh, any session that has a panel with someone uh, participating called Louis Damour. It's bound to be quite interesting. <laughs> a great name. Uh, and uh, uh, I think we, you know, we, ought, we should probably start off by going around the panel and giving everybody a chance to make some uh, introductory comments. So I'm going to take that as a, as a warning to the other panel members and come back to Mark to start off, as these things are his idea. So he can uh, maybe make the initial uh, reflections and then we'll work away. Uh, uh, along the panel. I think, um, see, um, it's my view that there are three huge challenges. I think I, may, I maybe said this yesterday morning. Three huge challenges in the world today uh, that face uh, policymakers, particularly those interested in international uh, relations, as many of you are. Um, well, one is economic uh, and trying to recover from the, the mess of 2008, uh, trying to build a, a better regulated but also a more equal uh, world economically. Uh, where prosperity is shared, but also more likely to be sustained. Uh, the second, I think, is in relation uh, to conflict and development, and uh, uh, getting uh, the development prospects of fragile states and conflict-affected states uh, in a better position, because those, uh, those countries are not only horrendous to live in, but are dangerous for everybody else as well. Um, and the third, uh, the third area is climate, uh, uh, and, and I mean, within, within the, the area of climate change, I think today perhaps, we should also, as well as talking about climate change, think about the wider environment, because uh, while uh, maybe instinctively we think about changes in the natural environment uh, and the threat that that poses to global uh, peace and security, I think the general changes in our environment, whether that's uh, urbanization, uh, which is happening, uh, uh, and, or, or or general threats and access to natural resources, um, particularly in the field of energy. Uh, these are all, I think, linked into a, a grouping of issues that, that threaten global peace and security and uh, uh, eff effectively challenge the quality of life that we're going to have in, in the years to come. So I think this could be a very, very interesting panel uh, if, we, if we just have a, a wider uh, definition of uh, climate change and environmental issues uh, 
uh, that affect uh, global peace and security. So I'll take a quick introduction from the round of the panel and then uh, uh, come out and we can get the discussion going, take some questions uh, from the audience, but ask Mark perhaps on behalf of the ICD to say one or two words uh, to get the discussion underway. Oh, thank you, Lord McConnell. I will be very brief because I'm curious in particular to hear from the panelists. Uh, but if we take the second part of the title of this panel discussion in terms of uh, climate change, in terms of global peace and stability, it's clear that uh, climate change is leading already to climate, migra to climate migration, uh, scarcity of resources, etc. Of course, this is going to become or has the potential of becoming uh, the source of many conflicts. Uh, so I think that kind of goes without saying. To look at the other part of the title, climate change uh, in terms of, let's say, an opportunity, uh, a cultural diplomacy and also at the ICD, we see climate change as really a major motivating factor for the work that we're doing. Uh, for us, cultural diplomacy is a means to an end. Uh, if cultural diplomacy is successful, you can have their education, uh, or let's say re relationships uh, that are educated and enhanced through cultural diplomacy and then built on dialogue and trust. So my point is, if this cultural diplomacy is successful, then it's easier for us to collaborate on issues such as, culture, uh, such as climate change. And that's where I think the connection is there. I think their uh, cultural diplomacy can assist to enable more cooperation. That can then hopefully uh, allow to alternatives to this threat uh, of uh, global peace and stability. And so that's for me the connection for cultural diplomacy and climate change, uh, and hopefully one way of avoiding uh, the threat of uh, conflict regarding climate change. But now I'd like to give it uh, maybe to Mr. Louis Damore, uh, coming also from the tourism agency, we'd be very, uh, tourism industry, very interested to hear your perspectives as well. And just to remind everybody, Louis de Moore is the founder and president of the International Institute for Peace Through Tourism, which sounds to me like a very nice way of getting peace. <laughs> thank, thank you very much. And, uh, and, and the name, as you've commented on, uh, goes with what I do. <laughs> I, uh, I agree with uh, Mark that uh, cultural diplomacy is going to be critical in the future because to resolve the problems that we have in the future is going to require international collaboration, not only among governments, but among the private sector, and NGOs, civil society generally, at all levels of society. And to achieve that cooperation, cultural diplomacy is going to be critical. I'd like to add that I, I think there's a couple of other critical issues uh, overall as you began the discussion. Uh, I would separate climate change and ecology, and ecology in itself is one of the critical critical issues. We currently use the equivalent of one and a half Earths to meet our annual ecological requirements, and clearly that's not sustainable. Uh, the other thing I would add is poverty, and, uh, and the third thing I, was I would add is the uh, inequality of the wealth of nations. So those are my Thank you very much. And uh, the next uh, contributor on the panel is Pilar Rukavina, who's an intern here at the ICD. Hi, I'm Pilar. Um, in terms of environment, um, I think it poses both a challenge and a real opportunity. On the one hand, because it's a common enemy, so it's really shared by all of us, and it's, um, it's less tangible than the threats that we normally encounter in international relations but I think that it's something that needs to be tackled by collective action. So you have to get everyone working together for one common goal. And so on the one hand, it, it manages to take away some of the divisions between us, so we have to work together. But on the other hand, I think that there is definitely potential for conflict here because, for example, it's aggravating tensions between North and South, North, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, sorry. Because for example, a UN representative from Namibia, he said a few years ago um, that um, he called the countries, the Northern countries emissions, he said they're equivalent to low intensity biological or chemical warfare. So it's actually a bit ironic because the countries that produce the least emissions for example, Namibia or Congo, are going to suffer the most from the effects that these bring. So I think that on the one hand, it's good because there will be international cooperation. There has to be. It's inevitable. I just hope sooner than later because the fact that it is a less tangible threat also means that action is delayed. But on the other hand, 
as you mentioned before, forced migration due to droughts or whatnot. Like for example, Darfur, many people have said that part of the conflict is due to environmental factors, such as the drought. So yeah, that's my opinion. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, I think that deserves a round of applause. That was a, I got a woo there. We got a woo from over here, so. Um, and uh, next contri contribution, we'll, we'll go over to this side here and, and uh, bring back to the stage Shannon uh, Stowell, yeah, uh, who is the president of the Adventure Travel and Trade Association. Thank you. Shannon. Thank you very much. We enjoyed uh, Scotland for our uh, Adventure Travel World Summit three years ago. It's an adventurous place. We were in the Highlands. Yeah. It's fantastic. Yeah. Um, I think when I, when I think about this, this issue, I like to put something in front of it, which is people are the threat to global peace and stability. People are causing the climate change problem. Um, and there's so much connected with it. Yesterday at the, at the ITV, I moderated the, the whole day of corporate social responsibility. So usually I run around and have to do all these meetings and it forced me to stay there and, and listen to every single panel. And it's scary. It's, it, the situation is, in some places, is dire. Um, I think water, water issues are gonna be a huge part of the problem. Too much in some places, too little in others. This has huge impacts, not just on tourism, but, but everybody and everything. Um, I think, you know, if I had any initial thoughts, it's we have to figure out how to get business to take climate change seriously, because we still don't. Business still looks at bottom line, return on investment, shareholder value, growing shareholder value, no matter what. And you know, you, you hear companies say, "Good news, you know, we reduced our waste by four or eight percent last year," and that, that is nice. It means we're going to health more slowly. Um, but the issue is that business needs to take it serious. Governments, of course, as well. But um, I think, from my perspective, business is is uh, one of the one of the chief problems. Thank you very much, uh, Shannon. And the next contribution, a round of applause for Shannon as well, I think. Yeah. The, uh, and the next contribution we heard from her earlier in the earlier, uh, earlier discussion from the floor is Nicola spafford Fury, yeah, who's the Vice President of the Earth Focus Foundation based in Geneva. Nicola. Thank you. I would like to say that what I will talk about young people Sorry. for giving this dreadful thing to me. And apparently the, the rising seas, there's no country who will sign a, uh, something to say we'll take the people who are moved because they're washed up. And where are we going to move from that if we don't open our hearts and ways? But I think also as young people, as a group, we could change many things because then business would listen. If any of you remember the Brent Spar incident, Brent Spar was when Shell said, we're going to sink that oil rig, it won't work anymore, we're going to sink it in the North Sea. In England and Holland, everybody stopped buying Shell petrol. In two weeks, they towed it in, cleaned it up, and put it apart. And I feel that we could all get together and do those kind of things. And maybe that would also help the stability. Well, that definitely deserves a round of applause. Talk about people power message there. And uh, last but certainly not least, um, uh, Giovanni Toronti. <laughs> and uh, uh, Giovanni. Yeah, um, I would like, uh, as uh, Shannon said, um, the, the real challenge is to get business, businessmen involved in uh, this awareness. It's also to get civil society more involved because um, as the title of the panel discussion said, is, uh, we're talking about a global issue that uh, involves multilateral decision and not bilateral. And when we talk about multilateral decision in, in, in international relations, there's always the risk of people to free ride. And by free riding, they will comp like jeopardize 
the whole progress that the negotiation have undertaken so far. And I think the only, uh, the only way to prevent countries or organizations of business to free ride in a multilateral um, negotiation is that if behind them they have the pressure from civil society, they know that civil society actually wants them to achieve an agreement on uh, cutting down the CO2 emissions and uh, and therefore I think one of the main focuses on uh, when we talk about uh, action for sustainable development should stress on education and on campaign to uh, raise awareness among voters because well most most of the countries are especially in the Western world are democracies and. As far as some people uh, may be contested, but we're, we're, we have some power and uh, throughout, with our votes we can, we can influence decisions. So I, I, would, I would put the stress on the, the importance of civil society and the civil society groups like ICD has in this, in this issue. Thank you very much. I wish he had been standing in the recent Italian election. There would been a bit more sense maybe <laughs> being spoken. Right, now we're going to open up uh, to uh, some questions and... Con one more There's always just one more speaker. Here at the ICD. <laughs> it's a moving feast. Well, why don't we start, and rather than ask the speaker to put them under pressure, why don't we start with the questions from the floor and then we can allow the new person to, uh, to speak uh, once they've had a chance to sit down and uh, take the breath, yeah? And be introduced. Um, so, right, I'm going to go, uh, I, I'm going to take maybe two or three comments at a time and pick members of the panel to respond to them and let's try and have a, a good positive interactive uh, discussion. Um, can I suggest if we can, maybe we, that we try and touch as well as the issues that have already been raised on things like what's the role of the European Union and all of this. It seems to me that 10 years ago the European Union was the leading international organisation on climate change and the environment and today we've lost our influence on that and I wonder why that's the case and what we can do about it for, for those of us who are from Europe. And also I think we have a huge issue about, and it's been touched on by some of the speakers, um, what is the responsible position for us to take in relation, for example, to places like Brazil and China who say that, uh, you know, should, uh, why should their development be curtailed because of the way that we have developed here in Europe and in America uh, over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. And I think there's, a, there's an issue here about balance. Uh, and the approach that we take uh, and the understanding the challenges that everybody, everybody has. So let's try and touch on some of these issues, a wide range of things already said. I've got a colleague here at the front and someone in the back row. And a, anybody over here? And somebody else on the front here. So we'll start with this, uh, this fella here. Hi, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Chris Castro again, uh, here from uh, Miami, Florida. And uh, with an organization called Ideas for Us, we're actually going to be speaking tomorrow, so I'm excited. Um, about my question, I think that it was actually raised um, basically the difference between the, the North developed countries and those in the South. And something that we tried to do with our organization is create a dialogue between youth in these different countries in order to really find the nexus of what sustainability means, right? In the South developing countries, they're really just trying to survive, they're really just trying to literally get by. Uh, whereas in the north, we're, we're trying to transition the way that we've actually built and developed our world. So maybe, you know, some thoughts about what the nexus might be between the north developed and the south developed countries. Great. Thank you very much. Very important issue. Colleague at the back. If you could give us your name and where you're from, that would be great. Thanks. that the next world war will be to do with water and access to safe drinking water and how maybe cultural diplomacy and the international community can be used to persuade countries upstream or up to another river or who have access to lakes how to improve their or stop their self-interest so in, in industry or from the government of how they can change their policies because it's often in regions where there's the con like the traditional conflict and mistrust and how maybe cultural diplomacy can be used to persuade states and business to change their policies. Thank you very much. Another critically important issue and the colleague at the front here. 
thank you very much. Uh, my name is Marjorie, I'm from Morocco, and I'm a student here at ICU. Um, uh, thank you for all your interventions, because I think each of you know I do just so much novelty in whatever I was told, because we all know the problem. I think we are, we are, uh, it's better that we move and try to find some solutions, uh, operational ones. Uh, I've heard a few uh, good suggestions, for example, the fact that probably you have to mobilize and like push like uh, uh, especially politicians in the like uh, electoral campaigns to put uh, the question of uh, climate change on the top of their uh, agenda. I don't find because always whenever they are talking about like the campaign, climate change always comes like as the last one. Even in this conference, like it comes on the fourth day as well. So I think we should put it on priority and also. Uh, I would love to hear from you some, like I heard Mark say, talking about like, it's true, there is like a big um, chance and a big opportunity to have like cultural diplomacy boost the, uh, the development or like the, the, the awareness of people and the government of this uh, uh, issue, but like I would love to hear from you how can that happen? Because you just mentioned that yes, there is like a great opportunity, but you offer uh, like put it and operationalize it so that we can get a uh, idea on that. And thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think those three questions, although quite different, were, were ultimately all about the relationship between people, uh, both neighbours and uh, on, on a wider level, uh, uh, the north-south divide. And maybe Mark, would you want to say a few thing, a few words about um, how diplomacy, sure, uh, these are the cultural and otherwise, can help us? Uh, take this forward. Sure, no, the transition that we've seen in the field of cultural diplomacy is the classical cultural diplomacy was about presenting our nation's image abroad. So let's present a good image of Germany or a good image of the USA, let's win the hearts and minds. Those kinds of cultural diplomacies won't help so much when it comes to climate change. Uh, the kinds of cultural diplomacy that will help, I think there's maybe a direct approach and an indirect approach. Uh, the indirect approach is essentially by establishing more understanding and trust between peoples as a whole, it'll be easier to collaborate. So I think in general, cultural diplomacy can help that way. The more understanding and trust there is, once we come to, come to Copenhagen or Cancun or wherever, the more likely we are to actually get results. The direct way would be like in conferences such as this, uh, which is organized by Institute for Cultural Diplomacy, talking today about climate change, talking this week about nation branding, about tourism, trying to directly deal with this. So the conversation isn't, tell me about your identity, I'll tell you about my identity. The conversation is, what can we do together, Morocco and the United States, when it comes to climate change? And then the way that could get translated, uh, the ICD, we have a concept called leadership initiatives, uh, where essentially as a follow-up project, you can actually come to us with your initiative. Uh, so it's not us giving you homework, go save the world or help climate change, change, but you come to us and say, okay, given my expertise, my network, etc., this is an initiative I'd like to make. This is what I have. This is what I need. And in the what you need section, that's where ICD advisory board, ICD staff, etc., can get creative and say, okay, how can we help you in terms of the resources and networks we have? And then you can get very specific on actually getting projects that will bring concrete results. So that's a brief response in terms of how the newer form of culture diplomacy, I think, can really have an impact on issues as challenging even as, as the one of, of climate change. Thank you very much. Pilar, you mentioned uh, Namibia and the impact that we in the north have on the south and your introductory comments. Do you want to expand um, on that at all? Okay, well, there's, I'm sure m most of you are aware of the debate, the um, development versus sustainability. So in a sense that, is this on? Yes, please. Okay. Um, so some people think that the two are mutually exclusive. So if you have, if, if I as an African country, for example, want to grow, I have to leave a certain footprint on the environment. So they consider it unfair, like you said, that northern countries are saying, well, no, we want to halt your development in a sense. So I think what has to happen is, I guess cultural diplomacy could, could be used to really inform these countries who have these hesitations, which are understandable, and like Giovanni said, um, educate the people and give them constructive ways that will allow them to grow in a sustainable way. And then I think the biggest problem is companies because politics is pretty much run by economic interests. And I think there's so much that goes on behind the scenes that we don't know about. And these companies and these corporations they're not transparent and they're not held accountable by, by the citizens. So we vote the politicians, but they get influenced by people that we didn't put there. 
So I think that maybe some form of um, transparency that they have to produce reports annually or once a year, uh, twice a year, sorry, and really make public their the damage that they've done and the steps that they're taking to reduce it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Shannon, I mean, you talked about business earlier. I'm just wondering, particularly maybe on the point that was made at the back about, uh, was it Nikki? Yeah. Uh, Vicky, Vicky, sorry. Um, who asked about uh, the use of water and so on. And I know that there are companies, uh, multinational companies, that are trying to think more about sustainable local solutions to access to resources and, uh, and so on. What do you think? Where do you think business should be going with some of these issues? Because they're causing an awful lot of the damage, not just governments. Sure. Um, also, a comment based on, on what you said earlier. Um, I used to work in environmental chemistry, and the, the, this is old data, so the, but the numbers make a point, which is until a family brings in roughly the equivalent of around, and it was a US dollar figure, around $5,000 a year, um, they don't that tends to be the line where people start to care about the quality of their air, the quality of their water. Below that, like you said, they're surviving. That number is really out of date. That's like 10 or 12 years old. But the point is there's some line where if you, people are below it, they can't care about it. They have much more pressing issues. Right. Um, you you, you uh, mentioned wanting to hear practical solutions. I can, I can give you one that we do, um, just because this is what we do. We're an association. Um, we have many members, and we have members who do amazing things with their businesses. They're saving, uh, they're saving forests. They're protecting cultures. They're putting 65% of their money, of the money the customer sends, stays, spends, stays in the economy. We, as an association, try to highlight those stories and say, it's it can be good business to do the right thing. And then, you know, of course, we do not highlight the situations where. We feel like it's abusive and, and exploitative. So I, I think um, I think also things are changing. I think, it, like you said, it, it's it's this generation that's coming into business and politics and art and you know e everywhere else. Um, I mean, it was not long ago the thought of women in the boardroom was laughed at, right? That was not long ago. The the comments about environment were laughed at. Even I would say ten years ago in the major major tourism organizations and I won't name any, but there's some major ones that kind of oversee and control a lot of the industry. We are still the hippies at those events. They still look at us and go, yeah, that's nice. Uh, do your thing, do whatever it is you're, you're gonna do. That's really cute. Um, but I think as their businesses start to, to suffer from some of these issues, from water, conflict issues, uh, that's, people only change when they're in pain. Pain changes people. That's the only way it'll change, I think. I'm having this image here of you as a hippie, Shannon, in your younger days. Right, let me take two or three other comments and then come back to the other members of the panel, rather than just have uh, members of the panel. There was somebody here about halfway along. If anybody else wants to as well, feel free to indicate. Hello, Martin Andrzejczyk from uh, the Earth Focus Foundation in Geneva. Um, the title is Climate Change is a Threat to Global Peace and Stability. Yet I think what's important to remember is we don't have global peace or stability in so many places in the world. We have Afghanistan, Syria, you know, a, a lot of conflicts, a lot of civil wars happening all over the world. And climate change is something that needs to be tackled holistically. Every nation has to take care and actually implement actions to tackle climate change. So don't you think a high priority would be to end these conflicts, to involve everyone and actually tackle it together? And that's maybe an interesting thing for people to reflect on. Do we end the conflicts in order to deal with climate change? Or do we deal with climate change in order to help end the conflicts? Uh, what, what comes first? Uh, is there somebody else at the front here? Nobody at the back here want to make any comments? Uh, got one, well, one at the very back, right? Good. So my name's Cade, I'm a master's student here at ICE. And I think, kind of go along with the, the businesses being a big problem, I would say the major issue is just money. Um, more looking at the oil companies and like, um, CO2 emission kind of thing. There's so much money involved in all these natural resources and everything. And one day some guy was like, hey look, I made a cool renewable energy thing that doesn't need any oil or anything, it just needs you know, water or hydrogen. 
something fancy and then you can drive, put it in any car and use it without any gas. Do you think the oil companies would be like, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> Never, like, there, there's no way that would fly. And so what, what can we do? Like, what, what if this happens? Like, I mean, I feel like this probably has been stopped plenty of times just because of money. You know, I think this is a huge issue to be, to be addressed and everything. So it's kind of just a comment or a question, but yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that. Darnell. I think Mr. Douglas had a comment. <laughs> keep it short. <laughs> He's always telling me to keep it short. I'm going to keep it very short. I had Ecology 101 in 1966 at Holland Park College. And one thing I remember, and I used to go to parties and tell people this, you know, in my early years in my 20s. He said that with a variance in the temperature of the Earth, plus or minus two degrees, it would be catastrophic. We've long since found out that the numbers have been manipulated, and indeed, we're approaching 4% uh, global warming. So I don't know what that means in terms of, uh, in reality, if you go from 2% to 4%, would that necessarily mean there'd be a doubling of it or quadrupling of it? Or you get my point. Uh, and then there are scientists who say that if we do undertake all of the measures now to combat climate, uh, climate change and global warming, that will be 3,000 years before we'll see any appreciable difference. I mean, one that we could gauge. So that's a pretty hard product to sell to a lot of people. I, I think that uh, we have to do something. I, I like the point that the young man here just made about war. Uh, we are in, indeed engaged in wars which have a tremendous effect on our environment. There's no question about it. If someone would try to quantify uh, the effects of war, on the environment, I think we'd all be shocked. You know, I mean, you just go back to Hiroshima and Nagasaki and, and then forward. Uh, very debilitating effect on, on, on the uh, economy and also on our environment. We are, one, one thing, the planet Earth is relentless. It doesn't know anything about uh, uh, cultural diplomacy uh, or whatever. It's gonna do what it's gonna do regardless. And we have to recognize that and act and act immediately. Thank you very much. Anybody else? There's somebody, somebody over here. Thank you very much. Louis, would you like to uh, respond? Yeah, absolutely. Quite, quite, quite a range of questions here, so you can, you can pick and choose. Um, with, with regards to war, certainly it's the most devastating environmental activity that there is. Uh, with, with regards to private corporations, Exxon is the sixth largest economy in the world. So clearly we have to get the private sector on board. That's just one of the multinationals, that the largest. Um, also in terms of the energy industry, uh, one of the things we have to understand is the amount of oil reserves that they have in their possession waiting to be developed. And it's in the trillions of dollars. So they're not going to be too quick to go for solar energy or wind energy or whatever because it would destroy their, their bottom line. Uh, with regards to CO2 emissions, a key number to remember is 350 parts per million. And I think we're currently at 356. And what's happening is 
an accelerated rate of global warming. The Arctic ice, ice cap has tremendously depleted in the last few years. And as it depletes, rather than having ice that's reflecting the sun that comes in, the blue water is absorbing it. And so you have an accelerated uh, effect, a feedback, positive feedback effect that uh, is affecting global warming. Um, having said all that, I agree with the previous speaker um, who talked about the Chinese symbol for crisis. And there's danger, but in that there's opportunity. And part of that opportunity, and countries are beginning to realize it, private sector are beginning to realize it, we're entering a whole new era. And that era is going to be solar-based. So there's all sorts of industrial opportunities in that solar-based uh, future that we're moving towards. As someone mentioned China. China just recently, at the last uh, World Energy Summit, announced that they now have a five-year plan for climate change. And you can bet that they have seen the potential in the solar industry. And when I say solar, I mean wind, ocean, all of it. Um, for the first time in the US, President Obama, in the last State of the Union message, uh, State of the Union address, put an emphasis on addressing climate change. It was the biggest segment of his State of the Union address. So I think there is hope out there, and we have to focus on that hope. We have to keep a positive outlook and work towards the future we want to see. The other comment is briefly in terms of water, and it relates to a number of other things. Environment and ecosystems don't respect national borders. So we have to look at ecosystems and work towards the healing of those ecosystems. And that means that each of the countries that are part of that ecosystem have to come together and collaborate. And that's the only solution. And when you hear everybody talking about the potential for conflict, the key word there is always potential. But we are not subject to forecasts. We can shape the future. And that's what we have to do through collaboration and working together to find positive, positive solutions. Thank you very much. Um, Giovanni, um, what would you like to see? All the, the, the comments and the questions brought a lot of, of um, content to the debate. But um, you know, I, I was thinking of what Darnell said about the fact that even if we start moving into a, a more sustainable direction, it would take more than 3,000 years to actually regain what we lost from the Earth. But at the same time, I'm thinking that, um, and I've been thinking it since I moved to Berlin, which is to me is an example of how People have been educated in living in a four million people city in a very sustainable way. I think things can be better, but uh, I admire a lot what uh, Berlin, how Berliner uh, approach the environment. And I see that actually living in Berlin because of this sustainability awareness, it's nicer than living in Rome and nicer than living in Mexico City or and I think it's, a, it's an aspect that uh, you realize this straight away when you see that there's no waste in the street because they put the deposit on the, on, the, um, on the glass bottles or they planted a lot of trees in the parks or there are a lot of uh, cycling paths and so uh, the families, the kids can go to school by bike and not using the car. So yeah, I mean, there is all you know, issues of uh, the Arctic melting and which looks like a huge and, uh, uh, obstacle that we can never solve. But at the same time, I think that sustainability is as a ex uh, self-explanatory uh, uh, word. I mean, it's the only way to go. There's no, if we keep on going like this, we're going towards self-destruction. And, uh, and because it's the only way to go, when you s apply a, 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 a sustainable uh, lifestyle, you will realize the, the benefits that you are getting straight away. And, uh, and I think that, uh, again, I would stress the fact that uh, it's really important that people are actually uh, taught about it. 
and uh, and and I would I would use and in terms of politics the example of Germany and because you uh, Kate said that um, um, you know against money against corporation there's nothing we can really do but a country like Germany is the fourth uh, fifth GDP in the world and. Uh, um, they got 80 million people and they have managed to build the entire town which is free of CO2 emissions. So I don't think, I mean, it's a bit uh, like renouncing from the beginning, saying, yeah, but there's the corporation that will never allow this and then, yeah, we're just, you know, citizens and we can't really do much about it. But I think it's, uh, it's really important that uh, the OCD the society, as I said before, the OCD society actually uh, became aware of the, of the impact that we can have. Thank you very much. And Nicola, I gave you a chance to wait because your colleague had intervened there from the floor yes, to ask you a hard a question. question. Well, definitely I agree with Martin about war because here we are sitting here very comfortably and we all people are being murdered in Syria and we don't seem to be able to do anything about it. And yet all of us who are feeling feel guilty every night. And this is where the, this definitely the conflict has to be looked at. But how do we do that? And another thing perhaps is do you think, because of business that apparently is being blamed so much, if there was a price on what we had, we judge the whole of the South by, they live on one dollar a day. This is wicked because most of those people don't ever see a dollar and never use money. But supposing we said, okay, they have a mango tree, that's worth something because it feeds them. They have a piece of land, they have clean water. Eventually you'll find that perhaps they're living on this nearly 5,000 that the family lives and maybe the businesses would understand so that a village could say, all right, you've just destroyed all our trees. That's X million. And if people, the people could start thinking that way, maybe business would suddenly think, oh, this is a bit different. Because I don't think most business people in the big things like Epson, you know, even for those poor birds in the Gulf of Mexico, they don't seem to care. How do we make them care? And it's only if there's a big enough movement to make the people who pull the strings care. And of course, politicians are there for four years, and they don't always care either, because they want the image for the next election. Shannon, Shannon's got a little bit to add to that, I think. Sorry. Yeah, that, that was great. Um, I'd like to tell a success story, too. Um, Namibia, actually. This is where we're holding our, our conference in October, our Adventure Travel World Summit. And most of the countries in Africa, this has some, this is less about climate change, but it's, a, it's an environmental issue that, that matters. Um, most of the countries in Africa, as you know, are losing their wildlife, right? That you, you see all the statistics, They're, it's all awful. Namibia is exporting wildlife to other African countries. Why is this? Because they changed the model of tourism. They're doing a community conservancy model. 400,000 of the two million Namibians live on community conservancy land and the tourists pay to come see the lions, see the desert elephants. And so there are 400,000 game wardens in Namibia who say, you're not taking our elephant, you know, you're not gonna do this to us. So it's become a business issue because now the locals all get something from it. It's not without strife or problems. Most of the lodges are owned by, uh, by uh, white Afrikaners. It used to be South Africa, right? And so that is, that is the, uh, the ownership model. But many of those lodge owners have now agreed to work with the communities and say, okay, here's what we need from you. you know, please, don't, please don't let anybody poach this elephant.